Do you think that uh, us encouraging people to specifically go and try to grow that part of the market is one of the critical point, you know, turning points for this issue? I do, I do. I think, I think what needs to happen is for us as consumers or as employees to communicate to the people we buy our fruit from or, or the people we work for and say, you know, I really want this. I want food that's produced without arsenic. I want meat that's raised without antibiotics. Um, uh, I want meat that's, uh, or, or dairy products from cows that haven't been raised on RBGH. So, Andy, I know over the years you've, you've attempted to, in hospitals in particular, go in and make these changes happen. What are the obstacles? What are the kinds of things we need to do here? Um, I think the obstacles that I've run into have been apathy on the part of consumers. Uh, for instance, I'm at the University of Arizona a health Sciences Center cafeteria, which is the one that I have most familiarity with, um, most people are just gorging themselves on the fried food and all the other unhealthy stuff that's offered there, and they don't agitate for better food. You know, if they put pressure on the institution, they could change things, but they don't. And the other obstacle, if you go in and try to change it, it's the food service provider. It's the, in that case, it was Marriott Corporation, which is one of a few giant, again, the consolidation has happened there. And there are a few big food corporations that supply food to all hospitals, prisons, senior facilities in this country. And they're only interested in the economics of that. And they're not gonna make any changes unless there's pressure on them to do that. So, I mean, those are the big problems that I ran into. There, there, there are some bright spots, though, that I want to yes, talk about. Yes, for a hospital, yeah. Um, and this has happened quite quickly. About 120 hospitals across the country have now signed something that we helped put together called the Healthy Food and Healthcare Pledge. And basically, it's a pledge for these hospitals to provide food that's not only uh, nutritious or nourishing to the individual, but also uh, 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 good for the social and environmental and economic health of the communities. And so um, these are institutions like Kaiser Permanente or uh, large academic institutions like Dartmouth, Mary Hatchcock in New Hampshire. I mean, what a novel idea. However, you said 120 hospitals, 45% right. of hospitals in the United States now have fast food restaurants on their premises. And just to tell you one story of the, of the problem there, a group of medical students from uh, the University of Pennsylvania contacted me uh, to tell me about their efforts to get McDonald's out of that institution. And they were finally told by the dean of the institution that if they persisted, they would jeopardize their medical degree. Um, that this, was, this contract was of such economic importance to the hospital. So, you know, this, this, is, this is what we're up against. And it seems to me that the only way that this can be changed is if consumers, you, uh, get informed on these issues and angry enough um, to demand change. And that's the same thing with the arsenic. So I think it starts with education and awareness and then a level of public interest that can, can change these kinds of commitments and institutional contracts. So we're, you know, the, my concern with our topic as a whole has been we move into the dark, bleak space, and it's hard to come out of it from here. And, and before we start seeing the light at the end, I think that there's one other place I wanted to bring up, which is it's not just food, but it's water. You know, in reading the headlines, I think it was particularly concerning to um, just today, the AP ran a follow-up story uh, on the failure of the White House task force to meet its deadline in addressing drugs in the drinking water. The AP did a five-month study where they started looking at drinking waters in uh, at least 24 major metropolitan areas, Southern California, Northern New Jersey, and lots of places in between had antibiotics, mood stabilizers and sex hormones, amongst other things, in the drinking water, um, which doesn't show up in the water reports for these communities. And so it's not just food. It's, it's, it's water and everything else that we're starting to deal with. And you know, the question is, how do we start addressing this? You know, how do we get ahead of that? And in that case, is there something we can do uh, personally while we're trying to get beyond it? Well, on, on just that issue of the pharmaceutical drugs in the water, it is unconscionable that this country has not instituted a sensible means of drug disposal. That is, people should not be flushing expired and unused drugs down the toilet or down the sink. In, in the United Kingdom, pharmacies 
uh, are where you deposit unused drugs, and pharmacists turn these in to be incinerated or disposed in some kind of safe manner. And it's just crazy that we haven't done that here. That would be a very simple step to take. I, th I think there is um, what we're running up into with that issue in particular is kind of the blinders coming down of people just not thinking about chemicals, and I'm talking both about nutritional chemicals, but also pharmaceuticals and toxic chemicals as, as um, things that can have an impact even at very, very low doses. And just to give you an example, uh, uh, birth control pills, the effective dose that they're supposed to have in the body is a fraction of a part per billion. Okay? This is an exquisitely small dose, and yet the uh, the, the reason for that is that hormones really are designed to act in the body at very low levels. Um, and, and they act to do all sorts of things from steering the development of the brain to uh, reproductive tract development. So it's very concerning to me um, that we're finding steroid hormones in the water. But it, it hasn't quite percolated into how we grow our food. I'll give you an example. Yeah, many of you, I think, have probably heard about DES, right? something, uh, a, a, a synthetic estrogen that was given to women who were pregnant, uh, supposedly to prevent miscarriage, although it, it didn't really do a good job of that. Uh, and it ended up being banned because we found out long after the fact that the children uh, born to these women had a higher risk for carcin uh, cancers of the reproductive tract. What people don't know is that starting in the 1940s, DES was put in chicken feed as a growth promoter. And it was also used in cattle feed. And in fact, DES was banned in the early 70s. It continued to be used in cattle until 1979. And today, we're still using six different steroid hormones as uh, 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 injected into cattle or put into ear tags as growth promoters. So our thinking about these hormones as being environmental agents of some importance hasn't really percolated through all our different uses, and I think we're going to have to get our hands around that, that, that these things are important. So in the meantime, to go back to practical steps, yeah. I mean, one practical step might be to eat fewer animal products, or if you are going to eat animal products, to get ones that are certified to be free of hormones and, exactly. and antibiotics and so forth. Exactly. Just, just ask, uh, you know, ask whoever is supplying your meat that you prefer meat uh, raised without hormones. So, you know, that, that comes to the next question. My, the local restaurants that I eat in San Francisco frequently, both in my neighborhood near my office, are local organic providers. I work really hard to go find restaurateurs who will do that. And they recently had to raise their prices significantly, you know, from a, from a 75 cents to a dollar per item, both because of energy costs, but also because of the demands on the system for scalability for this. So it, it raises the question that comes up a lot. Is this too expensive to do in a lot of ways, and how do we think about scaling it? You know, how do we as a society say we have to, to change this? Well, well the, the folks that talk about the agriculture in the middle problem, they actually say it's not a scale issue, it's really a market structure issue, and, and not to get bogged down in economics, but what they mean by that is our system right now only rewards the biggest companies and the very smallest companies if they're organic. And the result is that we've got way, way more demand for these healthy raised products than we have supply. And so, of course, the price is high. But if we were to invest as a society in increasing the supply of that, of that better product made by these larger farms, I think the price would start to come down. Um, and at the same time, there's some other factors that are going to make those really um, what have been too cheap foods more expensive. Uh, you mentioned the fuels uh, and the higher price of corn as well. Well, that, you know, that comes back to the subject of the public forum last year at our conference in San Diego, which was the Farm Bill, uh, which has been up for debate and is quite near passage uh, at this point. And, uh, we tried to get a grassroots movement going to change some of these patterns of subsidies. Uh, the basic problem there is that the federal government, uh, through the Farm Bill, subsidizes 
only five crops, and particularly corn and soy, and that's why very unhealthy ingredients in processed food are there because they're so cheap, especially high fructose corn syrup, uh, which I believe is a major driver of the obesity epidemic in kids, and refined soybean oil, which is the major, major reason why most of us are eating a pro-inflammatory diet uh, that promotes the development of many chronic diseases. We do not provide subsidies for fruits and vegetables and foods that have protect health protective elements in mm -hmm. them. How do you change that? Uh, the grassroots movement that we tried to get going this year absolutely failed. Um, this was the first time that any effort was made to, to get the healthcare community to weigh in on the Farm Bill because people in the healthcare community have never realized that Farm Bill policies have any effect on what they're concerned about. Uh, the, the industries that benefit from these subsidies are huge conglomerates that are making out like bandits from these federal subsidies. And the amount of lobbying pressure that they can bring to bear on the Senate dwarfs any uh, lobbying to the contrary at the moment. However, I think if an effective movement could be gotten going, it would be very easy to demonstrate that the cost to society in terms of of health care, of paying for the health consequences that result from these unhealthy ingredients in food would greatly outweigh uh, the amount of money that these industries can use to influence votes. But we lost totally this time. Um, there's another issue up, still up for grabs in the Farm Bill that maybe you want to talk about. One of the provisions is for country of origin labeling so that when you go into a store, if you buy meat or fish or shellfish, you would know where it's coming from. There are very powerful interests who don't want you to know that and are trying to defeat that bit of legislation, which is up in the Senate for a vote at the moment. Do you want to comment on that, David? Yeah, well, uh, you know, actually, um, there was some language in the last Farm Bill in 2002 that, that would have done some of this labeling of country of origin for beef in particular and some other seafood products, but there wasn't enough pressure on the USDA to actually implement it. Uh, and, and so one of the problem with all these issues, the farm bill country of origin labeling, is that the only legislatures that hear from anyone are, are the rural legislatures, and who they're hearing from the most is the big agribusiness companies. And so the temptation, I think, is realistically is for the urban legislators and the suburban ones to trade their votes away in the farm bill because they don't think anyone cares about it in their districts. And so it's the same with the country of origin labeling. If they heard from people that I want to know where my food comes from, and the polls say that 90% of the American public really does want to know where their food comes from then there would be more of a drive, I think, to get this so passed. I have to say, I mean, in the discussion up to this point, yeah. almost every issue that we've talked about, to me, comes back to education, raising of awareness, raising of consciousness among ordinary people, and especially consumers of food, which all of us are. And that the, the way to changing these patterns is just through that. Well, I think that uh, one of the things you said, Andy, is this is the first time yes. that anyone's tried to right. change the farm bill. And lots of times it takes movements, a number of attempts at right. getting going before they happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, should we anticipate that the next time we'll have more momentum? The farm bill is up, is up for renewal every five years. But each year, uh, Congress has to pass what's called enabling legislation in which funds are appropriated to uh, actualize the provisions of the Farm Bill. Uh, for example, in the last Farm Bill five years ago, there was a very good provision that was passed uh, establishing subsidies for organic growers uh, and for sustainability. But the Republican-dominated Congress at every enabling legislation thwarted funds to go for implementation of those provisions. So, you know, this is, there's, even though the next Farm Bill won't happen for another five years, uh, every year there's an opportunity to influence uh, its policies, and this is something I would urge you all to get involved in. Well, and I think it's important to recognize that the food sits on both sides of the aisle. We all eat, and I think it's not, if people start moving through education, I don't think it's right. going to be either 
a uh, Democratic or Republican issue that I think the momentum will come from all right. states if people start to get educated. And, and I, I would say just for myself, a few years ago, I, I was completely uneducated about the Farm Bill. I think like most people that I knew, uh, when I saw anything about it in the newspapers, I thought this has nothing to do with me. You know, this is something that has to do with people, not farmers in Iowa. And why should I even bother to read about the Farm Bill? So I, I have learned differently. There's, there's actually a website called healthyfarmbill.org uh, where people are still before Friday, Friday is the deadline on this year's Farm Bill actually, and if they can't get a deal done by then, uh, they delay it another year. <laughs> so I did want to say, you know, Andy, that, that uh, there are other ways that people can affect these, these food environments a little closer to home, though, other than just through big national policy like the Farm Bill. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, basically, all the hospitals in Portland have gotten together and uh, uh, asked the dairies that supply them uh, not to give them milk with RBGH hormone. Uh, raised with RBGH hormone. And as a result, most of Oregon is now RBGH free. And I, I think by focusing sometimes at the state level, even at the municipal level, and focusing too on some of these community institutions like hospitals and schools, we can actually make some progress. This is uh, RGBH is recombinant uh, bovine growth hormone. And uh, this is banned in Canada and many other countries. Uh, Americans have been relatively apathetic about that issue. Uh, I've written about some of the concerns I have about use of that, but I hadn't, I don't think I've really had any firsthand experience of it until a couple of weeks ago I was in Israel on an agricultural kibbutz uh, that was boasting of its incredible milk production. You know, they held the record. They had a, one cows that were producing 60 liters of milk a day. <laughs> and uh, we were taken, you know, into the, to watch these cows being milked. I have never seen cows like that. You would not want to meet a cow like this in a dark alley. <laughs> <laughs> these cows were the size of trucks. And their, their udders, I mean, I, can't, I don't know what, it was like the biggest beach ball that you can see. Imagine with the teats touching the ground and the cows could barely move to get over to where they were being milked. And um, I asked them about their use of growth hormone and they said, oh, well, they thought it was being used here, but they weren't quite sure. I mean, this, this, <laughs> I mean, these were cows on steroids. I had no idea of what this actually looked like. Maybe it was in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just, just to be clear, that the issue with RBGH is not that there's residues of the hormone in right. the milk. There's a couple of things that worry people. One, the cows burn out. They're producing so much that their lifespan's dramatically shortened. They also tend to get a lot of udder infections. Well, I wonder why, with the teats actually exactly. touching the dirt. <laughs> and so the farmers, what do they have to do if there's an udder infection? Give them antibiotics. So cows there, There's another issue that, however, that really worries me. Although bovine growth hormone is not the same as human growth hormone and is inactive in the human body, it stimulates production in cows of another hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is identical to that hormone in humans. And there, are, and there are residues of that in the milk, and that hormone is a known cancer promoter. So that's an issue that, I, that I'm quite concerned about. So I would point you to our... Uh, 10 steps that you're getting as you came in, and it's number two on the 10 steps that we're going to be walking through more of these as we start to leave the bleak part of our conversation and start to move into what can we actually do. But before we dig in too far there, um, I wanted to bring up some of the first line of defense. You know, how do, we, how do we start to treat ourselves differently around this? And Andy, one time in conversation, you brought up the, um, your concern about the proton pump inhibitors and um, Prilosec yeah. and other things going out there. How do we defend ourselves against toxins, and what is happening? Well, well, that uh, question you brought up is interesting. Uh, you know, the, the GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, is a major industry in this country today, and it seems to me uh, mostly this is your stomach telling you that it's unhappy either with what you're putting into it, the combinations of what you're putting into it, the emotional uh, state that you're in while you're attempting to digest food, or other things of that sort. And the goal is not to try to suppress that process, it's to try to figure out how to make your stomach less unhappy. Um, there's a, 
an over-the-counter product, I don't remember what it was called, that I've seen advertised on television a few times, that seems to me to sum up this philosophy of approaching a lifestyle-related disease. It was for, um, it was some over-the-counter acid indigestion remedy, and the uh, commercials showed a mother uh, in a car with three kids who were screaming at her, and they're at a drive-in uh, fast food place, and the kids are urging her to eat onion rings, and she can't eat onion rings because she gets horrible indigestion, and the answer is you take this pill and then you eat the onion rings. Well, that's not, <laughs> that is really not the integrative medical approach to, to this kind of problem. And uh, it is, it, millions of people are now taking these expensive pharmaceutical drugs which shut off acid production in the stomach. And that's not the right strategy, except very short-term management. For one thing, when you suppress uh, physiological processes like that, as soon as you stop using the drug, there's an incredible rebound effect. More acid production than ever, so it makes you very hard to get off them. But a worse problem is that stomach acid, which is very, very strong, is your major defense against infection coming in by the oral route. So that with so many people walking around with suppressed acid production, uh, I think this is one factor in why we've been seeing in the past few years much worse, much more severe kinds of GI uh, infections, um, norovirus outbreaks, but things that really knock people down. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's something to look at. That's one of your natural defenses, which you want to keep in good working order. So as they start, uh, if the folks who are with us today start leaving those behind and saying, what else can they do? How would they manage that? Well, you don't stop them suddenly. You know, with any of these kinds of strong suppressive drugs, you want to wean off them slowly while doing other things. There's a very good natural remedy that uh, we often recommend in our clinic called DGL, deglycerizinated licorice. It's a licorice extract uh, that rather than suppressing acid, works to increase the mucus coating in the lining of the stomach and the esophagus, making it more resistant to irritation. And that in combination with dietary adjustment, stress reduction, avoidance of known irritants like uh, coffee, for example, alcohol, can be very helpful. Okay. Well, so uh, as I started to explore what can we do, um, it reminded me of... Um, Something that, you know, I watched Stephen Colbert. And, um, and he's got this term truthiness about things that are, sound like the truth but really aren't. And uh, Michael Pollan, who's been with us before, talks about nutritionalism, which is the attempt to uh, understand food based on its components or creating nutraceuticals and things. And one of the questions I have is, are we overdoing it? Are we, are we adding more things than we really need? How do we look at sort of what we take in from the, from the beginning? And how do we avoid truthiness in food and, and nutritionalism? Well, there's several issues there. I, I'm suspicious of the whole nutraceutical approach uh, that is using foods as, as, me, as medicines by spiking them with um, dietary supplements or elements taken out of other foods. I, I just, you know, I don't, I, if I want to take saw palmetto um, herb for a remedy, I would like to take that as a medicine, I don't want to eat chips that have saw palmetto added to them. Um, I think that there are, you know, one of the concerns about soy in our society is that there's a lot of foods out there that have fractions of soy added to them. Uh, things like soy isoflavones, which are the estrogenic elements uh, added to other things. That may not be a good thing to do. For one thing, it may lead to people taking in far greater amounts of those um, than they would be otherwise if they're drinking soy milk and eating foods that are spiked with this and taking supplements. So that's one issue. Um, Michael Pollan also, you know, he raises that the, the looking at food as sources of nutrients rather than as something to be enjoyed. Um, I think that's a great difference between us and the French, for example. Uh, the French look at us as a nation of health-obsessed nuts uh, who can't enjoy our food and as a result are eating very low quality food in huge quantities. Uh, I think that they do better than us in a lot of ways. They don't have the kind of obesity that we see here. Um, they, they 
really enjoy food. They take time to enjoy it. They aren't hung up about getting pleasure from food. Um, they eat things that we consider rich and unhealthy, but they eat them in moderate portions and they don't snack all day. And I think that is attributable to some of this different way of looking at food. And the rumor is French women don't get fat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. David, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I kind of share um, Andy's skepticism, uh, and I, I think the sort of that knee-jerk reaction to look at uh, nutritional deficiencies and trying to address them by putting some kind of synthetic nutrient in to a food really begs the larger question, which is, uh, you know, why are some of these foods maybe lower in nutrients than they ought to be in the first place? And, and we're actually starting to see more and more science now get done looking at the effect of um, agriculture systems that just have focused on producing more, okay, which is by and large what we have in this country. Uh, and, and what they're finding is something called um, uh, the dilution effect. And actually this has been studied for over 25 years, but, but what it suggests is that when you only focus on producing more or bigger uh, um, food commodities, that one thing that happens is that the nutrient concentration can decline. And, and there's some evidence now for that. Now the flip side is that, um, for example, with grass-fed meat and dairy products, we're finding that when you put cows back on grass instead of grains, which, which is the way their stomachs were intended, uh, their ruminants, um, you see some nutritional benefits compared to conventionally raised beef, that is beef raised on grains. And so the, the meat from those animals and the dairy products tend to be lower in saturated fat, uh, tend to be higher in some omega-3 fatty acids, and higher in another kind of beneficial fatty acid called a conjugated linoleic acid. So I think that's the right approach to say, you know, what's the healthy system for raising the animal? And it seems like some of the nutritional uh, concerns maybe address themselves then. How about fish in that regard then? Uh. Uh, and this is a big concern to people today. I have long uh, recommended to people to eat more fish, uh, especially as a source of omega-3 fatty acids and avoiding the uh, saturated fat and other problems with uh, meat. Um, but there is a lot of concerns about fish today. Well, and, and coming from uh, San Francisco, they just canceled the salmon season for us in our area because the populations are down. So, you know, what are the trade-offs? How do we think about that? Well, you know, I, I think there, there are some good ways to think about it. Uh, obviously, there's not a lot we can do in the short term about the mercury contamination problem, but what we can do is to identify which fish to avoid because they're higher in these sorts of contaminants. Uh, and, and then also, which fish we want to eat because they're higher in omega-3 fatty acids and find sort of the common ground there. So there's some really good fish guides out there now. There's one produced by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's another that Environmental Defense Fund has put together. And they've created wallet guides that um, show in a very easy way for consumers how to target the fish that are both healthy for you, healthy for the ocean, because they're sustainable fisheries and not being depleted, and then also healthy because of the beneficial fats. So for those of you keeping score, we've covered one, two, and three, I think, of our list so far. So um, keep track of where we're at on this one. Um, there is uh, some recommendations on here of places to go look online that uh, David has given to us to say where we can find out about fish and also grass-fed meats. Um, I want to... Uh, I want to move on from that to uh, jump ahead to number seven, um, which is plastics. And plastic bottles, plastic packaging, how do we store things, how do we keep things, how do the gym bottles work for us, how do we think about this? This is, I mean, there's plastic everywhere in your life every day, including on the table in front of us. What do we do and how do we think about this? Well, I think this is a disturbing uh, issue that has uh, crept up upon us. A lot of plastics that we thought were inert and safe now may not be 
so inert and safe. Um, I've switched to using a stainless steel water bottle, um, and I recommend that you do that. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about some of the issues with plastic wraps for food.